the wonderful talk and Dr. Kumar for the invitation to participate today. Um, again, I'm uh, Jeffrey Gross, MD. I'm uh, practicing in both California and Nevada in the United States. And um, I'm pleased to be here today. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to go backwards a bit. I, I hope I don't have too much overlap with Dr. Malhotra's wonderful talk uh, and where Dr. Malhotra uh, was, you know, spent so much time going over PRP so eloquently. Uh, I, I hope to take that all the way far to the other end of the regenerative spectrum as it exists today. But I want to go backwards first. And I think Dr. Malhotra also talked about inflammation. And we know this means the general redness and swelling, pain, heat of the body. We learn this uh, in our medical training and, and, and see it probably every day in our practices. And we know this is a body's protective and healing reaction to insult, to injury, to infection, what have you. Um, it's usually divided to acute and chronic uh, types. And um, the, the definition uh, of cellular, now we're gonna go to the, to the cellular means and it's defined as an increase in activity, uh, forgive me, in um, the nuclear factor kappa B. Now, this is interesting. The cells actually have a change internally, which is happening while the macroscopic changes are happening to the body. And this NF kappa B is a gene transcription factor working in the nucleus. So we'll keep that in mind. It's found in every cell and it activates the inflammatory response. Now, I put inflammatory here because, in quotes, because the word inflammation is somewhat general, it's somewhat vague, and hopefully we can pin it down. We already have two different definitions of it here, acute versus chronic in the body and, and in the cellular, an increased activity in a particular protein. Um, also, I should, I should note, I'll, I'll give some references during the talk. Uh, there are others. I'm happy to take any questions or connections after the talk to supply those to anyone who's interested. We know the, the cardinal signs of inflammation. We know that inflammation uh, is, at the, is at the root cause of many uh, disease processes. Um, but we also know there's a microscopic and cellular aspect. Um, uh, on the left, you can see um, what's happening, uh, you know, um, microscopically uh, as a reaction to inflammation. Uh, you can see intracellular or even intranuclear what's happening and if you'll pay attention, you see NF kappa B is, is a very large uh, mediator of this cellular response. Whereas we heard earlier about PRP, there's so many factors uh, involved and growth factors and, and uh, these kinds of things that work both intracellular and extracellular. Uh, some of the proteins that, that drive what DNA is being transcribed to make proteins in the inflammatory response I will talk about in this, in this talk. And you can pay attention to also here, you see the interleukins and interferons are some of the active cytokines. So, you know, dogmatically and medically, uh, acute inflammation was, 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 was this response to an injury or insult, but then that is supposed to turn off or taper off because if it does not, it progresses to chronic ongoing inflammation and if that is not regulated properly, it does not fully turn off, you have long-standing and chronic illnesses. Uh, you can have continued damage to tissue and organs for the same reason. So in some ways, healing is a successful turning off of that acute inflammation without the prolongation of ongoing chronic inflammation. So hopefully we better define what inflammation is. Now those, those acute and chronic uh, inflammatory responses are different and they involve different proteins and cascades of activity inside the cell. And you can see here some examples of the interleukins uh, and the other growth factors uh, involved in the immune response component of in inflammation. <clears throat> um, however, chronic inflammation leads to fibrosis and disease as I mentioned. You can see some of the cellular biochemistry here. And uh, if, if you'll note, uh, some, of these pro some of these proteins that are enacted and turned on represent these cascades of activity in, in, the, in the cell that uh, occur when a patient and its cells respond to an inflammatory insult. So 
it, it makes sense for us to consider inflammation in a different way or redefine it. This is really a reactive cellular behavior at which time various cascades of enzymatic activity are set forth, set forth a macroscopic tissue change or behavior. And these processes should best turn on and then off successfully so that healing is optimal with the least scar, the least functional impairment and the least metabolic dysregulation, metabolic both of the organism and at the cellular level. If these inflammations are too robust or poor or underregulated, by severity and or time, we have these consequences or effects of such chronic inflammation, such as autoimmune problems, arthritis, metabolic deficiencies, and what have you. These are diseases. So if we can understand infl inflammation in better detail, we will understand disease in better detail. Think for a moment how a young person heals to a laceration. A child scrapes his knee, you clean it up, you bandage it, usually within a few days that, that, that abrasion is improved. Uh, and a much elder person might have bruising around the site. The laceration may take many more days to heal. So we need to learn why that occurs so we can take advantage of that to help our patients. Um, we will come back to the disease in a moment. But also the body cells and inflammation is affected by, by the environment. Oxidative stress is a pro-inflammatory oxygen reactive species response to, to it within the cells and tissues. Usually these are environmental. Uh, it's also a cell signaling factor. These also beget disease as you can see in the graphic. As you see at the bottom, some of the things that we as humans uh, experience or self-inflict are obesity, overweightness, unhealthy diet, smoking, um, and sedentary lifestyle. We don't uh, have an effect on genetic predisposition necessarily, um, but these, these factors influence oxidative stress and these lead to the diseases shown here in this particular graphic. It include very common diseases, diabetes, cerebrovascular disease, hypertension, et cetera. What are these sources of oxidative stress? Well. Sunlight, UV light, um, you know, uh, other types of radiation. You think about the excitement in space travel coming up here, hopefully in the next decade, too far away uh, uh, places. Uh, these, these astronauts will experience significant radiation and that's being talked about how to protect them. Um, we have pollutions in the air. We have uh, smoking, metabolic issues and inflammation. Now look what's in the center of the diagram. Oxidative stress and the ill effects of inflammation affect ultimately DNA. The DNA is damaged. And what happens when the DNA is damaged is the cell eventually goes through apoptosis or cell death. Some can convert to cancer. Ultimately, if we protect our DNA, uh, we do better longer. Um, here in this graphic, you can see some of the more, more significant and complex intracellular activities I, I put some blue arrows to point out some things I'd like to draw your attention to. You see the NFKB is in the heart of all this activity, as I mentioned earlier, because it's part of the inflammation cascade, but also gene expression can be stimulated to release, you can see in the lower left, uh, what are called HSPs or heat shock proteins. And we'll come back to that shortly. Now, all this stress sounds horrible. We should just live in a plastic bubble or sit on the beach and and with a cool breeze and, and have no stress and we would be fine. Well, interestingly, that's partly true, except just the right amount of stress is actually cleansing for the cells. Uh, for example, sauna. Uh, there are, are many great Finnish studies uh, of, of frequent sauna users and whole body heat stress triggers some of the physiologic responses observed with exercise, including the expression of one of the heat shock proteins heat shock protein 72. And these, these numbers have to do with their molecular weights. So what's going on in the cells? Cellular aging is thought to be an accumulation of oxidative stress. Again, I, as I explained earlier, this, this leads to altered gene express, expression and the DNA eventually being damaged through this process. 
ultimately we must protect our DNA. If not, we get cell death. We, cells age and then die. We want to stay young, we protect our DNA. So let's look how these two things, oxidative stress and inflammation, uh, relate to each other. Um, the chronic inflammation in a predisposed susceptible cell can lead to cancer. Uh, inflammation works possibly in part by inducing mutations through oxidative and also nitrosative stress and release of free radicals fosters the inflammatory cascade causing a vicious cycle. In other words, the inflammation begets oxidation and uh, fosters the inflammatory cascade. Additionally, on cellular aging, chronic inflammation is associated with age, age-related diseases, loss of resilience, and senescence. And senescence is also associated with the release of pro-inflammatory proteins. So inflammation causes cells to age, aging cells release more pro-inflammation. Pro -inflam In other words, aging accelerates, aging begets aging of the cells. But senescence is a general response to stress. So let's study age. Temporal age and physiological age, and by physiologic, I could mean cellular, are not the same. Um, let's, let's learn from this so our patients can benefit. Um, the study from the New England Centenarian study noted that exceptional longevity runs strongly in families and diseases are compressed towards the end of those exceptionally long lives. Also genetic influence upon survival increases with older and older and older ages of survival beyond the nonagenarians. But for some rare examples, cent centenarians have just as many disease associated genetic variants as the average population. So how do they do well? They protect their DNA. And here, age related disease means how fast the cells are oxidized and how much inflammation is occurring. So age is really an accumulation of oxidation and inflammation. Consider these two women. We both know patients like this. Uh, both of these women are 70 years old and they look very different. Their cells have aged at different rates, but they are the same temporal age. So what are the specific factors that we can consider that deals with that difference in the rate of aging? Well, there are many to list, but we have learned from healthy young stem cell signaling through extracellular vesicles that are given off by these young stem cells, referred to here as exosomes, that certain components serve to foster healthy young cellular cascades of biochemical activity in the cell. These are the cascades that are working against the inflammation or working for DNA repair. They are the anti-aging pathways. And these are certain heat shock prote proteins, but not all of them. And these are also promoters of specific genetic transcription and protein synthesis, also found in exosomes, such as the miRNAs and others yet to be elucidated. So let's talk about what you do to protect DNA. Well, naturally occurring are caffeine, rosemary, vanilla, um, also found in the environment are ferritin, metallothionine, also sub-1 nuclear protein. There are supplements you can buy on the market that are supposedly uh, doing this thing for you. We've also learned that telomere length is a measure of age of a cell and of a person. Uh, and this was some uh, celebrated work. Uh, and um, there are certain proteins relative to this. Um, if I can draw your attention to the blue lines on this slide, you can see, all, of course, our friend NFKB um, is at the center of the DNA uh, and, and TNA, uh, telomere length um, activity. But I've also mentioned heat shock proteins. And these are seen in many types of shock, not just heat, but they're named heat shock proteins because of how they were first discovered. And these can occur with response to various stresses, including nutrient deficiency, oxidative stress, inflammations, ischemia, various things. Some of these have benefits and some do not. Some are protective, 
but all of them are highly preserved and seen in all kingdoms of organisms. Think about that for a minute. These proteins are quite primitive, not just humans, primates, vertebrates, animals, but all kingdoms of organisms. Um, heat shock protein 27, for example, is anti-apoptotic. It prevents cell death. It also promotes our friend NFKB. And you can see in this very messy biochemical diagram of the cell. And if I could draw your attention to the blue lines, you can see uh, some of the important heat shock protein activities uh, involved in the cellular cascade and uh, uh, cytosolic and also nuclear activity. Why is this interesting? Why did we just spend the last 12 to 14 minutes rehashing uh, years of biochemistry in medical school? Because there are these great little extracellular vesicles we've learned about, many coming from young healthy stem cells that have therapeutic benefit. And these are called exosomes. Exo because they are external or given off by a, a cell. And somes meaning the bodies. So these are small bodies. They're called micro, uh, micro vesicles uh, and um, particularly exosomes. And they contain a, a lipid membrane like a small cell. They do not have a nucleus or organelles, but they do have heat shock proteins. They do have growth factors. Some of the growth factors listed earlier by the first speaker. Uh, they do have these elements and even sm some miRNAs uh, to transfer to a cell. And what are they doing? They're signaling. Uh, this is the signal from one cell to another. It is a paracrine response. It's one cell telling another cell to wake up, turn on, uh, do a certain activity. If it's from a youthful, healthy stem cell, then it's neighboring stem cell or a neighboring differentiated cell will also then have some of that uh, robust intracellular metabolism. Here's another example of the exosome. You can see again, the heat shock proteins are demonstrated. So what are some of the other observations on age defiance and healing? Uh, well, we know that calorie restriction is associated with longevity. Uh, fasting, um, uh, for example, the uh, great study in, in the worms uh, that we know of, and for the, if you follow this graphic, uh, one of the pathways involved that's suppressed by calorie restriction is the mTOR pathway. And the mTOR pathway is also involved in, in exosome um, metabolism. I'll show you that shortly. But this mTOR pathway is interesting because it plays a role in fibrotic disease. As you remember from my earlier slides, fibrotic disease really is code for chronic inflammation. mTOR regulates uh, autophagy, which is uh, the cells knowing when to, when to die off. Um, it's important for protein synthesis. It's a measure of, uh, which, which itself is a measure of cellular me metabolic activity. Um, hyperactivity or hypoactivity of mTOR are both seen in disease states, meaning mTOR is this sort of important regulator of metabolism and uh, factory output, if you will. Uh, decreased activity of mTOR is seen in increased lifespans of worms and fruit flies, as I noted to you earlier. Calorie restriction, as I noted, decreases the mTOR activity. Interestingly, mTOR activity increases with age or becomes less inhibited, thereby increasing its activity, meaning it's out of regulation and therefore the cells don't behave right. Caffeine, berberine, uh, quercetin, and Resveratrol found in red wine and on other natural compounds inhibit mTOR. Uh, and those are found to be um, uh, potentially healthy and, and associated with longevity and as an antioxidant. And if, if you follow the, the, blue note, the blue arrows, you see the involvement of the heat shock proteins in the mTOR pathway and how these all relate. I wanna shift a little bit for one more thing before we, we bring, this all, bring this all together and make sense of it. And this is called extracellular matrix. And some of you may remember the, the excitement about uh, uh, this extracellular matrix. Uh, it, what is it? it, it's, um, it is the, it's the stuff be between the cells in the tissues. Uh, it's now actually commercially available in a powdered form for wounds and for healing. Um, it's probably the reason why surgery in amnio does not leave a scar. I'll, I'll come to that in a later slide. So is it, is it, it is possible to adult 
to alter adult wound and wound healing so that it can heal more like a fetal-like process without scar. This contains collagens, fibronectins, proteoglycans, glycosaminoglycans, all kinds of structural proteins. And guess what else it includes? Extracellular vesicles, exosomes. Get in the picture. So about 30 years ago, uh, some of the earliest surgery in utero or in amnio occurred. These were children with spina bifida and they're now done fetoscopically, but they were done open. And what happens is these children, these, these fetuses are operated on for spina bifida. They go back in the wound, they close up the uterus, then they're, de then they're uh, delivered later. And it was found that they had minimal scarring. And this is an example of a child with a minimal spina bifida scar on his, on his or her back. That's interesting. There's something about that amniotic fluid that is causing scars not to form much at all that are somehow modulating the infl inflammation process. What's in amniotic fluid? Well, abundant youthful stem cells like crazy, various surfac surfactant and, and growth factors, some of the very same things we see in PRP and, and other preparations. Um, you, may, you may note some of these very things that were listed in the prior talk. Um, but also extracellular vesicles, exosomes. Those are probably given off by the stem cells in, uh, in the fetus or in the amniotic um, structures. So what would be the goals of learning from all this and doing something with it to help heal better, combat inflammatory problems and disease, and look towards regeneration? Well, if you were to write the perfect script, you would limit acute inflammation, to only the minimum amount necessary to achieve the healing function desired. You would suppress chronic inflammation. You would limit oxidative stress or be able to repair against it. You would protect your DNA and you would maintain the happy, proper uh, cascade and metabolism within the cell, just like it was a stem cell or a differentiated cell behaving like one. These are the more youthful and active stem cells. How can we get there? Well, exosomes might be the way. Now, exosomes are usually derived from um, mesenchymal stem cells. Um, they are uh, active extracellular vesicles. They signal their neighboring cells, both stem and non-stem, to, to participate in these similar youthful, healthy cascades of cellular biochemical uh, and molecular cell biology. The sources are PRP. There are exosomes most likely in PRP, particularly if you're using the, uh, the uh, uh, leukocyte rich. Um, there are not many. There are more exosomes found in preparations of autologous and heterologous stem cells, including amniotic sources. But it was found that even centenarians have stem cells, they're just largely dormant. And when they are given um, stem cell transplants, whether autologous or heterologous, it wakes up their own stem cells and it probably wakes up those stem cells through cell-to-cell -cell signaling through exosomes. So why not skip ahead and deliver the exosomes themselves? Why harvest the, the, the blood for the PRP, which is a lot of work? Why harvest the, the bone marrow or the fat? And we'll get back to the fat in a minute. Why harvest that when you can just have the purified exosomes? And they're now commercially available uh, in the US and probably elsewhere. So we, we talked about exosomes again. This is just another example. Uh, you can see heat shock proteins are in exosomes. These are, again, these preserved, important, um, you know, basic uh, primitive uh, proteins that get things going. Now you can also have a cell under, under a stress response that, that changes what types of heat shock proteins it's presenting. And we're learning more about this. And eventually we will know which ones are are the right combination and the right balance of these things to have the proper gene transcription and protein synthesis and activity in the cell. But the best recipe for regeneration is to give happy young stem cell communicating signals, exosomes, in situations of injury or disease or to slow cellular aging. Um, I would not want to have the exosomes come from a stressed or, or unhealthy donor cell. And that's why the next line says fat source, as you may know, those uh, who deliver bone marrow and harvest bone marrow um, 
fat and bone marrow are the, uh, uh, bo bone marrow are the two source of stem cells. Uh, forgive me if I misspoke. Fat and bone marrow are the two uh, sources of stem cells, but but fat is a is a dystrophic tissue. It's a it's a lipid storage problem. Those exosomes given off by stem cells in the fat source may be promoting the wrong idea. I think your healthiest uh, meso mesenchymal stem cell come from the bone marrow. And they come from your, the best comes from your, your most youthful bone marrow. And even better than that, come from you, uh, you know, it, from an amniotic product. That's why my favorite source of exosomes is from perinatal, perinatal sources like amniotic fluid, amniotic products. Uh, and these, these mo most companies that drive these, they come from C-sections, planned C-sections and consenting mothers. This would normally be medical waste. And they're, they're spun down to the proper size and, and um, tested for disease and are, are, are perfect for this process. And you know, they contain the heat shock proteins, they contain many small uh, uh, RNA particles and other growth factors. But this is just the beginning what we're doing now. These exosomes are generic. I, I see in the future cell tissue function and content specific and even designer exosomes coming down the pike. We'll have exosomes to deal with diabetes, we'll have exosomes that will be for uh, you know, enhancing joint problems. Now, I, I wanna finish up by talking about my passion, that's the spine. Um, uh, I didn't uh, introduce myself completely because I was struggling with the slides at the beginning, but I am a spinal neurosurgeon first and, and, and a biochemist and regenerative medicine uh, doctor second, uh, although that, that, that they may be coming uh, in balance shortly, but I've treated spine uh, for my entire career. Back pain is, a worldwide problem, neck pain as well. Uh, I treat problems in pain of disc origin, facet joint, mechanical, other and combined sources. And uh, as you know, uh, uh, this, is a, this is a cartoon of the slide, but um, the, the spine degenerates with age. And I should also say the age, degener the age causes the spine to degenerate, they, they go together. And this is, this is known uh, as the doctrine of Kirkcalde Willis. Uh, whereby the, the disc loses its hydration, it loses its height. Uh, the, the end plates of the vertebra feel this pressure, this pain, uh, the, they sense it, they, they start to make cellular changes in the bone marrow to lay down more bone, to increase its surface area to handle that pressure. And that's why we develop the bone, bone spurs, which we also call spondylosis. We also can have facet joint changes that go along with that. So what are, what are the uh, stem cell therapy uh, uh, strategies in discogenic back pain? Um, I'm referencing some, some, some major work, um, but what's very interesting here is just published in the Journal of Spine Surgery in 1999 was a paper on stem cell injections into the disc. There was no mention of exosomes. There was some mention of PRP. So when patients come to me and we talk exosomes, and they say, well, uh, you know, we, we've heard you're involved in stem cell medicine. We'd like to talk about stem cells. I have to say, sorry, stem cells are very 2019. Let's talk about exosomes. Um, but but the, the, the most robust work, work with uh, now three-year follow-up is from uh, uh, Dr. Patin. And um, I listed all three of his papers here. The last one, he's been injecting um, PRP and bone marrow concentrate into uh, degenerated discs. Um, and I, I must show you the next slide. This is from his three-year paper. On the left, you see a side view of the lumbar spine, uh, also on the right. On the left was the before. You can see the bottom two discs where the white arrows are, are somewhat dark compared to their neighboring discs. These, this dark refers to uh, a dehydrated state, uh, uh, less water content in this T2-weighted uh, MRI. On the right, um, this is after uh, three years of, of uh, I believe at bone marrow concentrate, uh, you have some rehydration, at least of the L4-5 more than the L5-S1 disc. So this is the first demonstration to my knowledge with the regenerative product uh, actually regenerating, actually showing a rehydration of a disc. And, and with that, of course, he had a reduction in pain scores and what have you, uh, uh, given, given that uh, I've, I've got a few more slides to go, uh, uh, we'll have to come back to that another time. But um, the, the, um, I want to list some problems with disc biology in general. 
there aren't a lot of cells in disc. And I'm sure that uh, same goes for, you know, knee meniscus and, and, and uh, hip labrum and things like this. There are not a lot of cells. Uh, we're talking about structural collagen and elastin and uh, mucopolysaccharides. Um, so the real health uh, doesn't come from injecting the disc. I, I believe I would follow the proposal of Dr. Hernigo from France, uh, who's been doing subchondral injections in the knee to delay the need for knee replacement. And, and he, uh, his work has found that the subchondral injections are superior over the disc inject, uh, or the meniscal injections, subchondral being in the bone above and below. So um, uh, that was also proposed to be done in the spine, uh, who I believe was the first to do it. A few others have tried it. And this is now uh, what I offer my patients is uh, vertebral subchondral injections with exosomes. <clears throat> Uh, and these, the blue arrows here indicate uh, the path through the pedicle of the injection uh, to get uh, the health. Uh, uh, so I observed that, that exosome approaches have a bimodal a response. There's an initial acute benefit. Uh, likely the exosomes are acting as an acute anti-inflammatory agent. And then a later more robust healing and reconstruction and regenerative um, response uh, by, by uh, removing dysregulated chronic inflammation. So, so I really want to rethink spine and joint pain. Is it chronic inflammation or is it repetitive reacute inflammation? Every time you bear weight, it's a new acute trauma. And I think the regenerative products are ideal for that type of repetitive mechanical stress on weight bearing parts of the body. So I, I don't think we will always be using words like osteoarthritis uh, when we talk about joints in the spine necessarily, I don't think we will use the word inflammation uh, vaguely, just like we don't really use the word lumbago so much anymore. We're more specific about low back pain. I think we're going to talk about uh, the more acute inflammatory changes of specific areas. So I want, I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to speak uh, today or tonight in my case. And, and uh, I think what we're doing now is, is not just a future thing, it's a now thing. And uh, thank you very much for your time. I, I hope that uh, you'll uh, reach out to me. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, email me, reach out by LinkedIn. And I'm, I'm uh, pleased and honored to be your world colleague in regenerative medicine. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gross, for your excellent talk. And I'm sure that there's a lot of interest in uh, exosome area and uh, we were receiving some queries also, so we, we will forward those queries to you. And uh, now I would request Dr. Castro to get ready for the next talk. So Dr. Gross, so what is your principal uh, indication for exosome in his spine and how you're using it? Uh, well, we're, this is this is uh, something we're developing, and it's it's new, and we're gathering our data, and we'll be publishing on it. But my my approaches are are uh, uh, paraspinal injections if it's multi-level spondylosis and pain, um, if it's it's facetogenic or facet joint based pain, uh, either either in the joint or I'm considering uh, in the future actually going into the bone on either side of the facet joint, uh, and then for discogenic situations, either as an adjunct to surgery, if there's a disc herniation, we are decompressing, or, or even percutaneously or through the pedicle, the subchondral vertebral body injections. Those are my main approaches to the spine. I, I, uh, I can't do all of that in the cervical spine uh, because of, of the, the danger of the size of the pedicles and what have you. So that would be more of a lateral injection into the vertebral body. Uh, similar to a uh, transforaminal epidural approach. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Gross, for your excellent talk.